For anyone who doesn't follow me on Instagram, I now have a dog. This is Taro. Say hi. Say hi. Mm. Cutie. He's gonna be a menace for this rest of the video. So if I am um, trailing or, or having weird cuts, it's because I have to make sure he's not um, eating everything. So today we're talking about Niko Kawakami's second book to get a lot of popularity. And I think this is one that a lot of people were waiting for for the longest time. It's All the Lovers in the Night. Personally, I didn't pick this book up for the longest time because it was like in between a hardcover and a paperback. The sizing is also different. Like it's slightly bigger than um, a regular kind of book size. And I find that really annoying when I see it on my shelf. But then I didn't think any other kind of copy was coming out in the UK anytime soon. Personally, I think it's great that she's picked up on the demand for her writing and priced her books higher, but yeah, I thought I'd mention that it is more expensive than um, a regular kind of paperback book. Please, no, no. So I read the first book, um, Breasts and Eggs, as an audiobook almost like two and two and a half years ago. Um, and that time when I did the review, I feel like it was before the book really blew up. At the time, I was just really into Japanese literature and I remember Murakami had also um, recommended her work. <laughs> Can you hear him? I'll link the review to Breasts and Eggs below if you want to have like a general background on uh, Miko Kawakami, but this is the second book I'm reading from her. I didn't really know what to expect because I didn't read the like title properly. I just went to the bookstore and I was like, all the lovers in the night. Oh yeah, it's Miku Kawakami's next book. The picture here didn't really give much away. So I was like, okay, I don't really know what to expect. I didn't know why I didn't think that this would be a love story. But yes, it is a romance. <laughs> and it's not like very long because the type is quite large. And I went through it pretty quickly. I did write with like pink pen, which I thought was really cute because it was a coincidence, but there is like a baby pink font to it. And this sits really well next to her other book, but I don't have that book because I think she used the same um, kind of that pastel pink shade that she used in Breast and Eggs. So once I have a physical copy of that, they will definitely sit next to each other. Compared to when I read her first book, she's definitely gained a lot of popularity. Anyone who is interested in translated fiction does um, feature Miko Kawakami on their feed or on their channel. So I think she's becoming one of those like more wider known Japanese novelists. And rightly so, I do feel like she has a flair for writing some of the most interesting female characters. And that is like what actually stood out to me for this book. It had a really strong start to it. It's not even like they were all good or they were all bad. It was just like really complex characters some of them kind of like in that middle gray area and i don't think you're at any point in the story rooting for any of these female characters or any characters at all because they are all in their own way very human and very flawed that's what i've always loved about japanese writing is just kind of you know how it is and when you look at a person on a surface level you might think that they are so and so but then the more you get to know them and the more you follow them through their life the more you uncover and the more you start questioning and that's exactly how this book is written because the main protagonist uh, her name is Fu Fuyuko Iri I believe and Fuyuko's character is like in the beginning this very passive um, very introverted, doesn't really have much opinions. She just kind of narrates the story as it's happening. She talks about what other women, like these conversations, she should relay them back. But she doesn't really give you a lot of input on what she's thinking. I will say though, this change in the main character from the beginning to the end did seem to me a little bit abrupt. She goes from being, I would say, very like one-dimensional to then being very complex. But there is no reasoning or there is no point at which you can just be like, okay, this happened, hence she changed, or like, this is the reason for her transformation. If there was something, or if there was a clear kind of distinction of like change in routine or change in something that led it to happen. Obviously she meets someone and this is a love story, like that has a big part to play, but I feel like nothing really happens. It's not like I was expecting something significant to happen for things to change. It's not even like she has a sudden like memory or she, it's like a build up of things that have happened. Things that have happened have built up over time anyway, but it almost feels like she went from zero to 100. And I've read stories that are similar and it does happen very quickly, but it kind of makes sense. In this case, I felt like the changes, although make sense for all the things that she's been through, were a bit 
too abrupt. Also, the love interest. I mean, I don't... The fact is, the love story actually took away so much from the story. They removed the whole romance element. I feel like the story would have been a lot more enjoyable because I didn't understand what his role was in this entire story. You don't even understand why he is romantically involved with her or why he's there in the first place and spoiler why he then leaves because the whole time you're just thinking like okay yeah he came spent some time with her and then left but like what was the whole point why did you do all of that just to kill time and i guess sometimes you can argue that there are some men like you never know what's going on in their head and why do they come in and do all of this but in this guy's case um, because of certain factors in his life, I just cannot understand. I just cannot understand what was going on in his mind at all. And I guess you can see that I have a general kind of like frustrations about the book and the way it was written. The main character almost is portrayed as someone who like lives in these days. And the love interest then comes in like almost too conveniently, at too convenient time. And these coincidences happen that make it feel like too much like a Bollywood movie. And it's just not something that kind of fit in together with the rest of the story. It kind of stood out, like how uh, Fuyoko's conversations were written with like her friends and then acquaintances and then with the lover. The lover part almost felt like, you know, this like Yoda kind of a character that was just there to give her like wisdom. But like, it's almost like the narrator wanted to say certain things but they want needed to introduce a character to say those things through if that makes sense because so far it's been a little bit harsh i have written down a, a couple points that i thought were really positive about the book and i will in no way take away from the fact that some of the parts of the book i did really enjoy there was very lyrical writing much like why i enjoy breast and eggs it's just flows so well and there's so much that I just wanted to underline and kind of reread and it was so beautifully written. It's just the story itself, like some things didn't sit right with me, but the writing itself was phenomenal. The women, oppressing women idea, like how she portrayed like most of the time in I would say Asian cultures, it's not necessarily just men who oppress women, it's also women oppressing women kind of if you've been treated in a certain way, you will tend to treat the, another woman the same way and not really give her a chance to rise above it. Like most of the time, mothers will want their daughters to be quite timid and um, respectful of men or treat men in their life a certain way or just kind of like accept abuse because they have themselves have grown up thinking that that is the way women should be. So women are sometimes um, more uh, become more of an obstacle in the lives of other women who want to kind of come out of it and grow from it and um, break free from those kind of like break free from those ideas that they grew up with there's also a bit on page 39 that talks about like the constant competition between women um, again, I think it's Hijiri talking as well. She says, I mean the ones who go around making absolutely certain they never challenge the men around them or threaten their sense of superiority. In everything they do, they're careful to make sure they never lose. They act like they don't care, but they live for it. You can see it in their eyes. Of course, the second some other girl with the potential to undermine their position, someone like them shows up, she crushes her like it's nothing. These women are heartless. I've seen it so many times and I'm sick of it. But I guess that's fine too. It's their life. Still, you know what really bothers me? That they're actually naive enough to think that no one's caught on their stupid little performance. Basically talking about how competition is really only between women. And when men are kind of above women in any position, women are not as competitive to rise up to them. They're more... Uh, likely to want to please them whereas if it is a, a, another woman above them or below them they're more likely to feel more competitive which i don't know if it's like real real or um true for everyone out there but i have experienced this in my own life as well so probably <laughs> although the main character is not a favorite of mine and not one that i kind of found that interesting i feel like one interesting aspect of the story was how she was not even a character in her own story like she was narrating the story filled with all this entire interesting cast and she didn't like portray herself as one of the characters forget the main character and i feel like in this world where you get like this obsession with being the main character and always having the world revolve around you it was a refreshing take to read something where the person is narrating a story their own story 
without them being at the center of everything. Some interesting questions the book raised. Um, page 103, our emotions, genuine responses, our learned behavior, how much of what we feel is learned? Because as we experience things and as someone reacts to something that's, that's just happened, you start to question like, oh, is that how I should react to things? Or like more and more with time, the more people we surround ourselves with, the more time we spend with those people, we also tend to kind of absorb a part of all the world that we experience and that plays such a huge part on how our reaction to things so how much of our own response is our response and not learned behavior which i think is so true and also makes me slightly understand the changes in the main character but still very abrupt and although the character is disengaged for most of the book towards the end she starts kind of making sense of why she feels this disengagement with her life. I'm gonna read a part from page 182. I heard a crow crying somewhere in the distance and turned to the window. It occurred to me that maybe I was where I was today because I hadn't chosen anything. I applied to whatever colleges my teachers suggested and fell into a job after graduation, which had left only because I had to escape. I was only able to go freelance because all of the legwork that he did for me had I ever chosen anything on my own? Made something happen? No once. And that's why I was here now, all alone. But I asked myself, haven't you always done your best with whatever you were up against? Haven't you given it your all whatever came your way? Unfortunately, no. That's not how things had been for me. I had faked it the whole way. In all those years of doing whatever I was told to, I had convinced myself that I was doing something consequential in order to make excuses for myself. And I was doing it right now, and perpetually dismissed the fact that I had done nothing with my life, glossing over it all. I was so scared of being hurt that I had done nothing. I was so scared of failing, of being hurt, that I chose nothing. I did nothing. But that's how people are, aren't they? Like, these, all these characters that were such, like, ping-pong characters, like, they're going, bouncing back and forth, and that's how they are, like, real people, because there's no predictability to real human beings just as there was absolutely no predictability to these characters i wrote a little um a review at the end of it which i think is so harsh but like i'll read it out anyway because apparently this was my thought when i read the book i feel like sayaka murata explores the same themes but in a far more unique and enjoyable way um i can't really say that though anymore because i feel like that's a very blanket statement to make i think it's just a matter of did you enjoy exploring those themes through this story or not. For me, the themes were excellent, the characters were excellent, it's just the story that didn't grab my attention or keep me kind of hooked. But everything else was great. I, I really did like it. I, I mean, there's so much from this book I wish I could just sit down and read to you, which really stood out to me. It's just that I'm not gonna lie. Like at the end of the day, you read a book or you review books based on enjoyability and what you got from it. Enjoyability was low, but for what I got from it, um, it was high. So take that as you will. There's no, I guess much like the characters, there's no straightforward review for this book for me either. So that was To All The Lovers In The Night by Miko Kawakami. I hope you enjoyed the review and hopefully I'll see you sooner than expected. <laughs> okay, see ya, bye.